All right, this morning we're ready for Hebrews chapter 11, and we'll probably get through maybe six verses. So we'll start with six verses and reading, reading them, and then we'll see the connection between this and the last chapter and go forward from there. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. For by it the elders obtained a good report. Through faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God, so that things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. But without faith it is impossible to please him, for he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. I think we probably are all aware that at least three occasions in the scriptures we are told that the just shall live by faith. And there are two specific prayer requests of the disciples to Jesus. One was, teach us to pray, and the other was, increase our faith. So here in the last verse of chapter 10 of Hebrews, the Holy Spirit moves the writer to proclaim, we are not of those who draw back to perdition or destruction or ruin, but of them that believe to the saving of the soul, or of those who have faith to the preserving of their souls. And of course, there were many people involved so far as the first recipients of the letter there were many who had turned away from the gospel and so the whole of hebrews or much of the hebrews is showing the superiority of christ and then there were those who are true believers whose faith was being shaken and of course we live in a day i assume this has really always been the case there are many who start well but finish bad Many who start out professing faith, but then they uh, fall out. And it's not only just your everyday person that starts out sitting on the front pew and winds up sitting in the back pew and then never comes back, but pastors and others. Uh, in the first century, there were many who were Jewish in their background who had appeared to come to Christ, but in reality they had not, and so they returned to Judaism. And so the, the genuine believers there were shaken. And so again, the superiority of Christ is set forth again and again throughout the book of Hebrews. So to the real saints in Christ, the Holy Spirit says, we are not of those who draw back to, to destruction, but to those who have faith to the saving, the preserving of the soul. So we, we learn something there about genuine faith. It is persevering faith. Uh, it is continuing faith. And obviously it would be because genuine faith is from God. And God is the author and the finisher of our faith, not merely the author and then he goes fishing. Uh, he, what he begins he completes. So with that verse leads us into this great chapter of faith, Hebrews chapter 11. And in verse 1, we start with faith being defined. Now faith is the substance, the assurance of things hoped for, the evidence, the conviction of things not seen. Faith is substance, it's, it's the title deed of things hoped for. It's not wishful thinking. It's confident assurance that what we have been given in Christ is real, and what we have been promised in Christ is just as real. Um, although the point of Hebrews chapter 11 verse 1 is, is not this, but the Christian faith nevertheless is deeply rooted in trust in what God has already done. 
Faith is substance. It is resting upon the conviction of what God has already done and the assurance of things hoped for. It is evidence of things not seen. Now you remember Jesus in dealing with the apostle Thomas says, Thomas, because you've seen me, you believe. You know, he, the first ones who gave report of the resurrected Christ is, I don't believe. He said, I don't believe unless I see the nail scarred hand. And so when he believed, Jesus said, Thomas, because you have seen me, you believe. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. So, uh, are you seated here today? Am I seated here today believing in Jesus? You've never seen him with your eyes, your physical eyes. Blessed are you who have not seen and yet believe. Hebrews 11.1, 1, faith is believing without physically seeing. It's a conviction of things not seen. It's living on the basis of that conviction. Christian faith is living on the basis of what God has said and what he's told us. It is simply, I like this simple definition of faith. Faith is believing God. Uh, you've heard the saying, God said it, I believe it, that settles it. Well, let's leave off the last part. Because God said it, and whether I believe it or not, it's true. But again, the, the point is well-meaning. Faith is believing God. Christian faith is believing and acting upon what God has said. It's not just having an intellectual belief, but it, there is a positive response to what God has said. There is a receiving of what God has said. So we're talking about faith to believe God to the point that we'll bank our lives on it. Just to use an expression. In these days of darkness, deepening darkness, upon what am I banking my life? Well, things are getting bad. They're going to get worse, so I need to get me some gold. But Proverbs eleven four: riches shall not profit in the day of wrath. Zephaniah 1, 18, neither shall their silver nor their gold deliver them in the day of the Lord's wrath. What am I banking my life on? We need to bank our life on the Word of God. The great need of this hour is to believe God to the point of banking our lives on what He says, not because I see it, not because everybody else agrees with it. Again, there, you go through Scriptures, and we are no different. We have the tendency to believe whatever the crowd believes. Twelve men go and spy out the land, the land of promise. Ten of them come back and say, oh, wow, it is a land flowing with milk and honey, blah, 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 blah. But there are giants there. And the whole crowd, you know what happened when uh, a year ago about this time, all the powers that be said there's going to be a virus that's going to destroy almost all the world, and they took all of our toilet paper away too. I don't know what the connection of that was, but that was pretty good timing. And the whole world went berserk. Well, this is not a new thing. It's, it's, it's an amazing reality of crowd control and of stirring people up with fear and they go bananas. It didn't matter that two men said, look, yes, everything those ten said is true. And there are giants there. But God! And if we are not focused in on believing God, then we'll fall right in with the masses. Huh? With the ten. Yeah, with the ten. 
Faith is defined as believing God. Now in verse 2, faith bears witness. For, the, for by it, the elders, referring to the believers of the Old Testament, obtained a good report. So here is the idea that the actions of the Old Testament saints bore witness of their faith in God. They acted upon what God said. They had faith to believe God to the point of banking their lives on it. And again, this is one of the reasons why this chapter is so very, very important to us. In a world where masses of people and the majorities of people don't believe God, God has ordained that we have this incredible uh, list of the heroes of the faith who, in spite of all odds, believe God and acted upon what God said. And there's, there's no, no greater thing that you and I need today than simply to open our Bibles and to devour the Word of God and to believe God and to act upon what He says. And that, <clears throat> that's why uh, God in his graciousness, these wavering uh, Hebrew Christians, uh, he shows all the superiority of Christ over the old covenant, and now he's going to bring forth all these people who've gone before them who likewise faced a crisis. And the masses of people are going one way and saying, this is the way you ought to go. And so here are these people who hoisted the flag of faith and simply believe God. In verse 3, through faith we understand that the worlds were framed or created or fitted together by the word of God so that the things which are seen were not made of the things which do appear. So what we now see did not come from visible things. We believe that God created the heavens and earth. Why do we believe that? Well, John McKay has come and he showed us all these things in the rocks. <laughs> well, there are some amazing things in the rocks that give testimony of God's creative acts, that give testimony of the flood, that give testimony of so many things. And he and uh, Ken Ham and others have done a great service and have been a great blessing and especially I'm assuming that Ken does the same thing but John always heads to the gospel because it's not enough just to know that there's some fossils here that recount or that give testimony to the truthfulness of God's word but it is because it's not because we were eyewitnesses of the creation it's a matter of faith God said in the beginning, God. It's a matter of believing what we have not seen. It's a matter of believing God's word. Now, a lot of times in the Old Testament, you have people who are believing God's word. God gave us words, specific word to Noah, and so forth and so on. He has, in these last days, spoken to us through his son. He has is, he is given the, the, uh, the scriptures and our point of faith is not a book, but a book that has been breathed out by the Holy Spirit reveals the true and the living God to us. Or our, our faith is not in the print and not in the paper, but that God has spoken and he has recorded, thus saith the Lord. Now, just like people who've gone before us did not believe what God said. Uh, you say, well, I, if God would speak directly to me like he spoke to, to Abraham, I'd believe. God has directly spoken. Do we believe? And uh, there's a reason why a lot of people, here's where they want to go. Uh, they'll say, something like this. Uh, we don't worship a book. Uh, our faith is not about a book. It's about Jesus. Just give me Jesus. 
So when I try to divide Jesus from the book Jesus gave us, I'm going to head for trouble. What's the trouble going to be? If I don't have this, thus saith the Lord, then the Jesus I'm telling you about and saying spoke to me is going to be something out of the imagination of my heart. And I like that because I don't want to have to bow to sovereignty. I don't want to have to bow to thus saith the Lord, end of the story. How are you going to, you going to obey or not? I, I won't. I, I'll, I have a better idea. Now, that's an old philosophy. God spoke. You can eat of this tree, this tree, this, this one. You can't eat of that one. Clear, direct, no ifs, ands, or buts. Ah, that's too narrow. I hate sovereignty. I have a better idea. Satan gave it to me, but he's a good guy. Seems to be a good guy. Anyway, I like his idea. So I'm going with it. Did that cause any problems? <laughs> Faith is believing God. Faith is believing what God says. Faith is acting upon what God says. Uh, again, you can go all the way through the history that's gone before us, and people have had a better idea. Mo jo uh, Moses, Moses is up on the mountain and Aaron, that wonderful pastor Aaron, we love him because he loves our ideas. And we go to him and say, we don't like this narrow God. We don't like this sovereign God. We want to be creative. Make us a God. Oh, I'll make you a God. And then we will worship the Lord. And that's all stated in Exodus 32. He led them in the worship of the Lord as they bowed before the God they had formed out of gold. What a wonderful God we have. They had a great celebration. One of the best worship services had ever been on the planet. And had it worked, Aaron could have written a book of how he won the attendance award. <laughs> and J Joshua was coming down with Moses and and, uh, oh, I hear the sounds of war. And Moses, who had been trained in the Egyptian way from a child, knew when he heard music that was not, uh, did not match and meet the character of God. He said, no, that's not war. That's music. And, of course, they were having a great worship service, worshiping the way they wanted to worship. So we've, we face that same problem. And we need to, we're either going to allow, we're going to submit to the word of God, or we're going to lean to our own understanding. So God called each of these Old Testament believers, and he calls us today to a life of faith to a life of believing God to the point that we would bank our lives on it. And so then in verse 4, through the rest of the chapter, we have examples of Old Testament believers who exhibited faith. And in every instance, the person or persons who had faith demonstrated their faith by actions, by actions of obedience to what God had said. Now, there's profound simplicity here <clears throat> and an astounding power that flows when we believe God. Now, I don't know if you've experienced this, but for many years, I would sit under the teaching of people who would go to various places in Hebrews chapter 11 and, and talk about faith and having faith. And in, and in most of the instances, it was about having faith to believe God for money. To believe God for this building program. To believe God for this house I want to buy. To believe God for this boat or this car I want to buy. About believing God for money. 
and believing God for all kinds of good things and not, but it was always about money. And I remember <clears throat> sitting with a friend and he was telling about how his brother, who was a pastor, was believing God for this big amount of money for something good that he believed God wanted him to do. Now, I'm not here to sit in judgment on that. I, I, don't, I don't know about all that in the final analysis. But then I started reading again Hebrews 11 about faith. And none of it was about believing God to get money or to get this or to get that. It was about believing God to obey what he said. So, in verse 4, we, so we start with Abel. By faith, Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, by which he obtained witness that he was righteous, God testifying of his gifts, and by it he being dead yet speaketh. We know the story. Cain and Abel both went to worship. They both offered a sacrifice to God. Cain offered the fruit of the ground. Abel offered the firstlings of his flock. And we know from Genesis 4, uh, verse 4 and 5, that the Lord had regard for Abel and for his offering, but for Cain and his offering, he did not have regard. And so what's the problem here? Uh, I'm sure that Cain's offering would have been impressive. It would have been the best of his fruits and vegetables. It would have been wonderful to look upon. But it had nothing in it that gave testimony that in order for a sinful man to worship a holy God, the sin problem has to be dealt with. There has to be the shedding of blood. And God had already rejected uh, Adam and Eve's fig leaves and had, had met with them on the basis of a slain animal and clothed them in the skins of that animal. And in Genesis 3.15, uh, there's a whole first prophecy of how that Jesus is going to be uh, kicked at the heel, you might say, by Satan, but Satan uh, is going to be destroyed uh, by the Son of God. It all came out. And the scripture, you say, well, we don't know exactly all the details that were given to Cain and Abel because the, early, early, the first 11 chapters of Genesis covers a mountain of information. We don't, we're not given a lot of details, but we have one book, one Bible, and it is consistent in its message. And when the day is over, we learn that there is no other, no other way under heaven for someone, for a sinner to relate to a holy God except through a blood sacrifice. Abel knew that. Cain knew that. And Cain chose not to go that way. His offering was comparable to fig leaves. But without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. So Abel's sacrifice was better because it was a picture of the ultimate sacrifice which we would, would be made by Jesus the Messiah. Now, as you and I come to worship, what offering do we bring? Um, I don't know this man's heart. I'm not going to name who he is, but he is now 90 plus years old. He is very well respected by many people in Sumner County. They think the world of him. He's a nice guy. And whenever I go to an assisted living place, uh, he is usually sitting there when I come. And uh, it's been a year since I was there because of COVID. Well, I got to, I'm supposed to go next week, but then last week, or maybe the week before last, they called and said, whoever we had coming couldn't come. Can you come on a short notice? I said, I'll be there. There he sat. And once again, and I have asked him about his relationship to the Lord. And he tells me all the things that he's done, all the good things he's done. And the church he belongs to. All the things. 
Never anything about, I came to see myself as a sinner, without hope, without God, and I'm trusting the blood and righteousness of Jesus Christ. You can put that in a lot of words and say the same thing. He didn't put any kind of words like that. His message is always, I, my hope of heaven is based upon all these things. Basically, it's what he had done. And he's not an arrogant fellow. He's sincere. He seems to be a humble fellow, and yet misguided, blinded by the gospel. So again, uh, had an opportunity to share the gospel with him in the context of with 12, 15 other people. Bless his heart, he's surrounded by women. <laughs> You know, they outlive us. We can talk about them being the weaker vessel, but they, they, mo they mostly outlive us. But anyway, uh, just pray. The Lord knows who it is. Pray that the Lord would open his heart, open his eyes. But the immediate question for us is, what am I trusting? Well, I'm a Baptist. I've been baptized. I've been baptized by the right way, by immersion. That won't get you into heaven. The hymn writer has it, nothing in my hands I bring, simply to thy cross I cling. What offering do I bring? Now, let's look at uh, verse 5 and 6, and we'll look at the example of Enoch. By faith Enoch was taken up so that he would not see death. He was not found because God took him up. I don't want to debate this, and I don't, I don't know. I wasn't there. I believe what was said here, but I don't know that he, God, uh, God brought about a change, even as when those who are here, when the Lord comes back, uh, those who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with him. Is there some sort of experience of death? Maybe, maybe not, but there for sure is a obvious, obviously a transformation from this life to resurrected life. Either way, however God does it, it's good, and uh, it shows the power of God over the penalty that everyone is under, the penalty of death. But anyway in some sense that we cannot fully grasp. Enoch was taken up so that he would not see death. It may be that he did not experience death. And he was not found because God took him up, for he obtained the witness that before his being taken up, he was pleasing to God. Without faith it is impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who seek him. So again, the, the key truth here is that Enoch was pleasing to God. Certainly a key truth. What was it about Enoch that made him pleasing to God? By faith. And then in verse 6 it says, Without faith it is impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of those who seek him. So faith is the necessary ingredient to pleasing God. The core essential of Enoch's faith was that he believed God. God, he, he who comes to God must believe that he is. And so in this sense, it's not just believing what God says, but we are believing that God is. So it is trust in, reliance upon who God reveals himself to be. And he reveals himself through creation. The heavens declare the glory of God. The, song, the firmament shows his handiwork, but he primarily reveals himself to us and exclusively reveals himself to us as the redemptive God through the written word of God. Uh, and this revelation brings about the transformation from death to life. 
we can say that Saul of Tarsus' conversion was maybe more dramatic than yours or mine, but it was no different. He's going down the road as Saul of Tarsus, dead in his sin, but highly religious. And in a moment of time, through God's intervention, he is now born anew and saying, Lord, what will you have me to do? The power of the Word of God upon an individual soul, raising the dead. And so it is not that God rewards someone who comes up with self-initiated belief. There, there is a human belief and faith by which people do amazing things and accomplish amazing goals. But we do not have the power to bring ourselves from death to life. What is the reward of those who seek God? It is that they find him. But the problem is, man does not seek God. Psalm 14, 1 and 2, Psalm 53, 1 through 4, there's none that seek God. Same thing in, in Romans 3, 10 through 12. And you say, well, I, I don't know that I agree with that because I see people seeking God all the time. Well, men seek God's blessings. Men will seek escape from hell. But man does not naturally of himself seek God to bow before him and cry out even as Saul of Tarsus, Lord, what, you, what will you have me to do? Nevertheless, he who comes to God must believe that he is a rewarder of those who seek him. And that he is a rewarder. Now let me ask you a question. Have you ever seen a turtle on top of a fence post? Turtle or tapin? If you have, how did he get there? You did, Jim. You confess. Well, bless your heart. We need to go and apologize for that turtle. He's probably still there. <laughs> <laughs> well, again, if you have or if you did it, you know that the turtle did not get there by himself. And in Hebrews 11, the kind of faith that is described is not self-generated. When any sinner truly seeks God, he did not get there all by himself. The Holy Spirit starts in, Hebrew, in John 16, verse 8 through 10, convicting of sin and righteousness and judgment. And then, like in Ephesians 2, verse 1 through 10, he starts out, verses 1, 2, and 3, uh, the nature of every lost person, uh, dead in sin, living according to the course of this world, uh, following the flesh, uh, following the devil, children of wrath, even as others. So here are these young Christians at Corinth, they're being reminded, of, this is who you were. And the last thing is, children of wrath, even as others. And that's the first three verses. It's the autobiogra autobiography of every human being on the planet. And the Holy Spirit starts there, convicting us of sin, righteousness, and judgment, that we're sinners, that our righteousness is as filthy rags, and that judgment is coming. Then what does the Holy Spirit do? Well, Hebrews, uh, Ephesians 2 verse 4 follows up, but God quickens the dead. Hallelujah, what a Savior. Faith is a gracious gift from God. And one of the encouraging realities found in Hebrews 11 is that the roll call of the faithful is not a roll call of those who were righteous in and of themselves. In this list, we'll find prostitutes and murderers and liars, real sinners who committed real sins, and they did not get faith by being good, by turning over a new leaf. 
they became good because they were given faith. And they received that faith from God. At the same time, in the New Testament, the command of God is given to the dead and sin sinner. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. You say, well, what good would that do? They're dead. The gospel is the power of God unto salvation. It is the gospel that God uses to bring about life. With God's command comes the enablement. How does Lazarus, and, and the King James really does it up good, he wasn't just dead. He'd been in the grave four days, and it says, he stinketh. Not just stinketh, stinks, but stinketh. And Jesus says, Lazarus, come forth. With that word from God comes the miracle. And so we may give the gospel, and we're to give the gospel to everyone. And as we give the gospel to everyone, when it's all said and done at the end of the day, when we get to the, to the end of time as we know it, there's going to be a numberless multitude out of every kindred, tongue, tribe, and people who are alive in Christ, who will spend eternity with Christ, because the gospel is the power of God unto salvation. Paul, so Paul said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel, because it is the power of God unto salvation. Here's a guy who can't walk. Jesus says, rise up, take up your bed and walk. And these things should greatly encourage us to give the gospel because we, 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 we cower down where well, they won't believe. And, and, and I don't know what God will use do this and some uh, uh, commonly leave a track uh, at a restaurant. So I... Uh, had not eaten at Mabel's across the street in many, many years. And I see all these vehicles there. And so I, I didn't want to drive anywhere. And I was here at the church building. So I stopped in and had a fine meal. And a nice waitress waited on me. And I left a track on the table. I'm a real shy person. I, I never said a word to her. Just left a track with a nice tip. Don't leave a track with a bad tip. So then the next day, as it worked out, Cindy said, uh, I told her I enjoyed it. She said, well, uh, I don't have anything in the house for lunch. How about calling in and getting, and let's both eat, but we eat the house. So I went and I called in and I walked up and to uh, get the two plates and a different lady was waiting on me. And the lady that, I, that waited on me was my uh, server the day before, came up to me and says, were you here yesterday? I said, yes. Well, you left me a pamphlet. Thank you. Something going on in her heart. Maybe she's already a believer. Maybe the Lord is using that to speak to her about something in her life. Leave a trail. Leave a track. Be bolder than I am. Give the gospel. The gospel is the power of God unto salvation. Jesus says, take up your bed and walk. Uh, Lazarus, come forth. With the command comes enabling. And so, let us give the gospel. In Hebrews chapter 11, verse 7, we start with Noah. Which, if the flood hasn't come a second time, we'll continue there next time.